So to that, to March the 3rd, 2016, this is CISG 113, Section 1, Information Security and Privacy. Today is day number 12 in week number 6, so let's get started. First of all, welcome back. Uh, this is day number 12 into the semester, week number 6. You can look at the Buddha environment, we'll discover that I had something not new, but something important on top of the Buddha environment. Immediately under the Learning Center syllabus, I add back the three important elements of this course, the general education, programming intended learning outcomes, seven of them, the course learning objectives, three of them, and the course intended learning outcomes, six of them. It's important that you start paying attention to the course intended learning outcomes because our uh, study from the second learning contract and the third learning contract together with your learning portfolio, the project, you have to do something to demonstrate you achieve those course intended learning outcomes. Okay, so I'm just trying to make sure that you do not forget them. So I put it on top of the Moodle environment and I also put it at each week's Moodle block. So you can see that at the beginning block of each week block, but also at the same link. They help to refresh your memory that these are very important things you need to keep in mind when you choose the topics, when you choose the activities to do in your team. By the way, you need to have your team form today by combining two pairs. Okay, when I check the record, I just got two teams who reported to me. That means so far I have eight pairs paired into two teams. So what about the remaining pairs? So may I invite you to watch the end of this week, okay, before the end of this Saturday, you go to week number six, Dr. Webb's Q&A hotline. So you go to Dr. Webb's Q&A hotline, week number six. You provide me with the information of your team, including two pairs. Make sure when you give me the message there, include the names of the two pairs and also the names of the pair members in the two pairs, okay? That will help me to install you into a team space starting next Monday. You have to have a team, all right, uh, before the end of this week. And again, if you look at the course artifact, okay, if you look at the course artifact for learning contract number three, which is the contract you need to submit, okay? It's a contract to be done by a task force, okay? It's a contract to be done by a task force. A task force is defined by combining two teams together. In other words, you're not going to work as a team alone, okay? Let's take a look at the, um, the submissions, okay? When you click on the second learning contract, it's supposed to be a teamwork which contains two pairs. But now, when I take a look at the mid-term course survey, okay, here, I think many of you have already read them because I released the result to you earlier yesterday, or actually on March the 1st. So you can see that the most important thing, uh, beside the previous four questions, is the last question, which tells me, okay, out of the 35 students who complete this survey, 29 of you say you would like to combine the two learning contracts into one. In other words, you do not need to submit the artifacts for learning contract number two on March the 12th. You just need to submit the artifacts for learning contract number three on April the 2nd, okay? Uh, we respect the right of these six students who would like to keep learning contract number two. Uh, allow me to say that, yes, you're still free to submit learning contract for learning contract number two, and you belong to one of these, okay? Your submissions will be counted accordingly, okay? Because this is the way to respect your personal choice. 
Uh, for the 29 of you who would like to just do learning contract number three, okay, you just need to submit the learning artifacts for learning contract number three. And that is the way to resolve the, the conflicts. And if you allow me to do it, let's go back to questions number one to number three very quickly. Out of the 35 students who complete the questionnaire, better say the midterm course survey, 23 of you say we're going in a pretty good phase. One of you say too slow. Uh, 11 of you say too fast. So the majority of you believe that we're going in the positive directions. So we're going to help you. If you are this person, come to my office and I can help you individually. Okay. Um, and then if you are one of the 11 students who believe we're going too fast, maybe you can group together and maybe we can sit together and tell what I can do for the 11 of you, okay? Um, and then let's see the question number two. How much do you understand uh, about the course presentations? And that is a very interesting thing. Normally, teachers talk all the time, but in this class, I share the time in class, so let's take a look at the result. Why would you say I understand 100% of the course presentations? Six of you said 75%, 19 of you say 50%, uh, only five of you say only up to 25%. So um, for 11 of you who understand more than 20, uh, 50%, together with the 19 of you 50%, so we want to maximize uh, the student on this side, uh, okay, so that we could have a class, uh, we could evenly distribute the knowledge. Now, the most important thing is we help one another. We help one another. You do not just do your studies alone. You have to pay a partner, you have your teammates. Ask help from them, okay? And if you really cannot do it, make sure you come to see me and let me know your difficulty, okay? How? much do you understand about the course materials? Here we have uh, two persons who understand 100%, seven, uh, seven of you understand 75%, 18 of you 50%, okay? Uh, looks like I have a call coming in, I cannot take it, so I need to close it. Okay, so now, again, do you understand the differences between course presentations and course materials? Now, course materials refer to all of those things we give you, okay? We give you over the Moodle environment. That is very important. And can you understand that? It is not my intentions for you to understand, or better say, master every piece of the information provided online. I provide more information there because they are there for you to make a choice, okay? It's not my intentions that you memorize all the material on the Moodle website. You have to make a choice of your work to study, okay? And if you encounter any difficulty on the specific choice you make, you may come to see me and see what can we do to help you understand better, okay? That's the way to go. Now, before that, it is preferred that you talk to your learning partner first to understand if you can get help from your learning partner and also from the teammates. And then you can engage me in the conversations to help you understand better. Okay, now so much for the midterm course survey. Let's get back to the business of today. I want you to get uh, formed into teams. So I want to give you at least five to 10 minutes time to talk in your table to see if you agree with one another to form teams. The teams is formed, or each team is formed by combining two pairs. If you do believe that you need to go over the table to talk to other members of this class, fine. But I just give you five minutes. So we're going to get back to our class in five minutes, okay? So, you're free to go to negotiate the formations of your team. Right? So in the minute, in the meantime, feel free to talk. Five minutes of free associations to make sure you have the team formed. 
before the end of this week, okay?
main idea is online advising networks can be used to inflict millions of unsuspecting web servers in attacks on other websites. And the bad news also is, um, it, is it doesn't cost much money to create and capture um, activities. So it doesn't cost much. And what you say? Research presented in a, in a Black Hat security conference held in Las Vegas. And an experiment of this is that two researchers who, who use a last money to buy a ad. And in this ad, they insert some uh, program language which can cause a browser surfers to being attacked by this kind of program language. Um, they, firstly I need to describe a word which is server. Um, in Chinese it is Cifuji. And in a server which contains online software and can link your own computer with working station and also can send your computer files to other. So in this experiment, they use only two dollars to, to to buy an ad in a in a website, and then the result is that more than 130 connection, uh, 30 thousand connections from browsers swarmed the server. It wasn't much longer until the server began falling offline under the growing load. So they use a Java script to. Um, write a program language and use it on the website. And it asks for everything from creating interaction filters to tracking with people, load or end, engage with a page. And after this experiment, they also create another experiment which is more, I mean, which can hack more people. So after reading this article, we know that Actually, by using ads, we can hack others. And also, uh, it doesn't cost much money. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. Uh, allow me to remind you, when your fellow student is making a, a sharing out there, can we just be very much attentive in order to show our respect to our fellow students? It's very important though, to do that, OK? So we thank you very much for Karen's first speaker. The second speaker, according to the schedule, let's take a look at it. It's Brew. Are you here, Brew? Thank you, Brew.
Okay, thank you very much for your sharing on the conductivity and contacts. Uh, that is from Bruce. Okay, remember, those of you who have already shared, make sure you go back to the website here, type in your sharings there. Okay? That is very important for us to do some follow-up. And the first person is supposed to be Gambo, but Gambo to change the time. So instead, we have uh, Heidi, who's going to take up Gambo's positions. Uh, Yet, uh, according to the order of the registrations, uh, we need to pass the time to, uh, is it Erica first or Star first? So, Erica, yes, Erica, you're the first. Uh, next, you're the next one first. Okay. Uh, I know Dr. Professor Mazza have already put us 
the web about uh, the quantum innovation and about the smartphone. And then this is also about very hot nowadays about the virtual reality. So what is the is the virtual reality? It can be referred to the immersive multiple multimedia or computer simulated reality. Replicates an environment that simulates a physical presence in places in the real world or an imagined world. How does the user to interact in that world? Virtual reality active and artificially create sensor experience which can include sight, touch, hearing, and smell. And, uh, and uh, this is uh, this is a picture shows how the virtual reality works. And it, it basically uses two images and to show in the in the machine, and you can watch it from the test over to become a, so the virtual you see it can become a 3D world. And uh, the use of VR you can find in the training and the video games. I think video game is mostly virtual reality uh, working. And the fine arts, uh, heritage, and architecture, architectural design, urban design, and therapy. And here I will show, I will show you a video about the virtual reality. Thank you. Look around. Technology is all around us. We use it in every aspect of our lives. It enables us to do amazing things. What if we could go further? What if we could go beyond the screen? Where your digital world is blended with your real world. Now we can. This is the world with holograms. What will they enable us to do? New ways to visualize our work. We have an idea for the full time. New ways to share ideas with each other. How are things going your way? I just put the images in one drop. More immersive ways to play. New ways to teach and learn. So put the new trap into place of the old one. And tighten here and here. New ways to collaborate and explore the places we've never been. Look at this formation. Let's take a closer look. And new ways to create the things we imagine. Thank you, Nicholas. And you know that Microsoft HoloLens, it's something very interesting. Are you going to discover a little more on this? So, Heidi, you are the next person. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just need to broadcast it. Yes. Oh, you need help? Because CISG, the main idea is about 
information security and privacy. And and then I want to ask you a first question. Do you try to buy anything in the internet? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, but, uh, what kind of you buy in the internet? Uh, all kind of something like clothes and maybe uh, some daily life. Daily life? Yes. Um, <laughs> okay, so I Some are of bad quality, but mostly it's good. Okay. Yeah, I agree with him. And I also like to buy something in the internet or some Facebook, Instagram. And then I always will get the thing is just like rubbish because this thing is not much for me. And then um, I want to share with is about my experience. Uh, my uncle. Um, I don't know why the people will get him message and the people call my uncle and tell him his son uh, his son has danger or something and make the, make, the, make make my uncle go to the mainland China and in the last he lose our thirteen million dollars in a Macau dollar. And so I want to say don't easy to up know your information or up know your phone number and email address to the internet because it's very dangerous. Um, actually, uh, the company will show your information to the advertisement and the advertisement will get your message and send a message to you or do something bad thing. So, uh, so we are teenager or we are we are smart people. We did it easy to to um, log on to some internet. This is my survey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heidi, for giving us some very personal stories on a topic called internet privacy. So, um, actually, today I'm going to help you understand something more on internet privacy. Um, let me give you a story which is based on a very interesting uh, teacher's experience. Let's see, uh, let's go back here first. Okay, right here. Yes. Uh, it's on day number nine, and I thought about this as I listened to the sharings today. Uh, almost three of you have chosen to find the CSD issues. I remember I put here a very interesting story, but when you read the story, think about the reasonable, whether or not it's reasonable to accept that, okay? It's called the intellect and our right to privacy, okay? Eight minutes. <laughs> The pictures were exactly what you'd expect from a European summer vacation. Cafes in Italy and Spain, the Guinness Brewery in Ireland. So 24-year-old Ashley Payne, a public high school English teacher in Georgia, was not prepared for what happened when her principal asked to see her in August 2009. He just asked me, do you have a Facebook page? And, you know, I was, I was still confused as to why I was being asked this, but I said yes. And he said, do you have any pictures of yourself up there with alcohol? In fact, the picture that concerned the principal, showing Payne holding a glass of wine and a mug of beer, was on her Facebook page. There was also a reference to a local trivia contest with a profanity in its title. She was told a parent of one of her students called to complain. And then Payne says she was given a choice, resign or be suspended. He told me that I needed to make a decision before I left that room or he was going to have to go on and suspend me. She resigned. Attorney Richard Stores is fighting to get Payne's job back. It would be like I went to a restaurant and uh, I saw my daughter's teacher sitting there with her husband having a glass of some kind of liquid. You know, is that frowned upon by the school board? Is that illegal? Is that improper? Of course not. It's the same situation in this case. But here's the really troubling part. Payne had used the privacy settings on Facebook. 
She thought that only her closest friends could see her vacation photos or her use of the B word. I wouldn't use it in the classroom, no, but Facebook is not the classroom and it's not open to the students of my classroom. They are not supposed to see it. I have privacy in place so that they don't see it. Privacy? What Ashley Payne or any one of us who uses the internet has to realize is this. Today our private lives are no longer so private. When we talk about a right to privacy, what we're really talking about is the right to control information we consider to be private. Frederick Lane is an attorney and the author of American Privacy. Considering what happened to Ashley Payne, does that mean that even when you think you have some amount of privacy on a page, you may not? You absolutely may not. All it takes is one person making a copy of what you've posted, and it's out in the wild, and you no longer have that control. And we're not losing that control, we're giving it away. Every time we buy with credit cards, use cell phones which signal our location, or post pictures on social networks like Facebook. Just sending an email may make public private information. That's what is a constant tension in our society. We trade information that our parents and our grandparents would have considered private for fun, for convenience, that kind of thing. We are our own or seven. I don't think there's any question about that at all. I think that we're giving it up. We're putting it out into the world. The tension between technology and privacy is nothing new. In the late 19th century, there was an outcry over a seemingly harmless invention, the first Kodak camera, and the birth of snapshot photography. For the first time, people were sneaking around taking photos of other people without their permission. It sparked this, an 1890 Harvard Law Review article in which the future Supreme Court Justice, Louis Brandeis, and attorney Samuel Warren warned against an ongoing loss of privacy. Today, one of the fastest growing businesses on the internet is something called data mining. Companies collecting our private information, packaging it, using it, selling it. I think this is a social security number. Yes, it is. So that's, so that's Michael Furtick, a Harvard Law School grad who runs a company called Reputation.com, came up with information I thought was private. I was wrong. He also revealed what he called my online reputation, based mainly on where I happen to live. Our query is pretty confident that you're a Catholic, and also we're pretty confident that you donate a lot to charitable causes. But that may not be correct. That's it may not just be correct. And then, there's something that could cause a real headache down the road. There's an Aaron F. Moriarty who grew up just a few miles from where you did, who has been convicted of serving alcohol to minors, and it would be very easy for a machine to confuse you and that person and to think that you are a convicted criminal. I mean, the reality is that most of the will have to be Verdict's company helps people track down and correct misinformation, but most of us will never even know it's there. The dossier on each of us that is easily aggregated digitally is now probably, let's say, call it 10 pages. Four years ago, it was two pages. In four or five years, it's going to be 100 pages. Why? Because the amount of data that's being collected about each of us every day proliferates. But David J. Moore, who runs 24-7 Real Media, an internet advertising firm, seems unfazed. He points out that marketing information about potential customers is really nothing new. Magazine publishers for years have been selling the list of subscribers they have to, to advertisers who want to send a mailing to them. And keep in mind, the more specific detailed the information, the better companies can target their advertisements to customers who really want it. Let's ask the 500 million people that are on Facebook, how concerned are they about their privacy? or the 100 million that are on MySpace. Most of them really don't care. Don't tell that to high school teacher Ashley Payne. Yes, I put it on the internet, so you can make the argument that because it's on the internet, it's public, regardless of whether or not I made it private. 
But it, it sort of feels like the same thing as if I had those pictures in a shoebox in my house and someone came in and took them and showed one of those pictures to my principal. What's worse, after she resigned her job at Appalachie High School, Payne says she learned the original complaint came in an anonymous email, not in a phone call from an angry parent. No parent has ever claimed it. There's never been any other complaints against me at this school from teachers, students, or parents. Officials at the Barrow County Schools who declined to speak to Sunday morning have so far refused to rehire Payne. In court documents, they say teachers were warned about unacceptable online activities. Payne's page, they say, promoted alcohol use and contained profanity. She is now in graduate school and is suing the district. She says she wants to be sure that the internet won't just record how Ashley Payne lost her job, but that she fought back. I want to clear my name, first of all. I just want to be back in the classroom. If not that classroom, a classroom. I want to get back to doing what I went to school for, you know, my passion in life. It's a very inspirational story. How much of this story have you got? It? Well, first of all, I would say that this is not a story that happens here, but it's a story that can help you think a little bit further about what's your right to privacy? What's your right to privacy? Well, you use the Facebook. I use the Facebook. And I guess you got some pictures on your Facebook too. Someday, when you go to an interview for a job, someone is going to search on you online and get all the data. Just like hiring the company that mentions there, get all the possible data of what you did in the internet. And they use that to go against you. Then why you should not be given a job? What do you think? Now, it's a very interesting case when you can put together the feedback from your table member and put some thought into it. And it's one of the many possible topics that you want to do in your learning contract number three, okay? It's a very interesting topic. All right, so the next thing I wanted to share with you today, uh, which is very interesting, let's see how much time do we have. All right, even though we do not have much time, I think it's still okay. Um, that it's about a web, web attack, okay. Let's see, um, did I use this story this time? Okay, two minutes. Thank you. 
During our experiment, we stumbled across what appeared to be a real hacker at work. Along with our fake network, there was another one called Free Public Wi-Fi. Airport administrators told us T-Mobile is the only authorized Wi-Fi provider. So you think that there could be a hacker here right now? That's correct. Catching and prosecuting a hacker, especially at an airport, is extremely difficult. E.J. Hilbert is a retired FBI agent who specialized in cyber crime. It's virtually impossible to catch it. Law enforcement's aware of this, and there's always the next piece. You steal the card, you steal the information, you got to use it somewhere. And that's when you start getting the real investigation going. Well, experts say there are a few things you can do to protect yourself. If you're at an airport or a public spot, find out who the Wi-Fi provider is and use that. If it costs some money, pay the money. They also say change your password every now and then and use different passwords for different accounts. Another tip, turn your computer off when you're not using it. And if you do go online using the public Wi-Fi, keep in mind that someone may be watching you. You don't know if you're getting on a true Wi-Fi or you're connected to some hacker's network. Like, you don't know if you're connected to me or if you're really connected to the airport. Technical CNN, Los Angeles. Okay, remember, on the first day of class, we have given you the Chinese versions of a news documentary produced by TVB, Jim, okay? And this is a similar episode of things like this, but it, it is a story produced in LA Airport, the Los Angeles International Airport. Now, I think most of you have actually used the free Wi-Fi make available to our use in our Hong Kong account terminal. How many of you have done this? All right. Or have you ever used the free Wi-Fi while you're winding the bow from account to Hong Kong? of Hong Kong to Macau. Do you find that there's more than one Wi-Fi available oftentimes, and you have to ask the crew there which one is the verified one, okay? This is a very interesting episode which tells you when you choose to use a Wi-Fi, better choose the verified one. And even though sometimes you choose the verified one, you're subject to being what? The subject to being what? Have the privacy taken away. Okay, so that is um, an interesting story. So today, because it's week number six, all right? So I would like to introduce to you to a number of documentaries about hackers' movement, all right? If you click on this link here, these are mainly the documentaries where you know what the Discovery Channel is on the National Geographic channel is, I've collected a number of those very useful um, documentaries which will tell you a little bit more about the hackers. For example, this is about 50 minutes. It gives you some pictures on the good guys, African hackers, the bad guys, the black hat, and if you watch this for 50 minutes, five zero minutes, you've got a, a very interesting perspective what they are doing, okay? And also something about uh, the movie, Insecurity 207. It's a very interesting movie to learn something about the hacker's behavior. Um, I cannot give you all of these, but I, I would like to make sure you get a small taste of that. One way to learn something is to watch Over the past 20 years, a new breed of people has been evolving. They have their own culture, their own technology, and their own languages. Among them are pirates and thieves, celebrities and philosophers, lawbreakers and police, heroes and villains. They operate all over the world, but their real home is cyberspace. And now there's a conflict in cyberspace between its outlaws and its angels. This is the inside story of the very different missions which now drive the diverse breed of people known to the world as hackers.
Dennis Treese leads one of the teams of frontline defenders positioned around the globe, ready to spot and neutralize the latest attack. The Global Threat Operations Center. This is where we monitor the hacker threat 24 hours a day on four countries. It's like the bridge of the Starship Enterprise. Minute by minute, hour by hour, every attack is analyzed. Any one of them could be the precursor to a bigger onslaught fired by a hacker anywhere in the world. We had uh, just about 400 pre-attack calls. Uh, in that hour, 1,500 denial of service attacks in that hour. In the last year, the team have intercepted 83 million hacker attacks aimed at the corporate networks they protect all over the world. He is flying through an asteroid belt all the time. He's constantly being uh, inundated with you know, decisions to go around these things up, over, uh, et cetera. What is it? Is it going to hit the ship? And if it does, is it big enough to do us in the It's a computerized game. The bad guys against the good guys, if you will. The emergence of internet good guys, like Dennis, is the result of a series of attacks by the bad guys often inflicted against high-profile targets over the past 20 years. One of the first was launched by the legendary Captain Zap. The man behind the comic book image was barely out of his teens when he put himself into the Hacker Hall of Fame. You just mentioned Captain Zap, and they go, old history, oh my god, bow. This is a real hacker. The target of Captain Zap's hacking was the computerized charging system at AT&T. The telephone rates are too high, just in general. So why not reduce the rates for some people? Or all people? To gather intelligence for his mission, Captain Zack went looking for a way into the phone system. We would go just for that. At the phone company, offices late at night. Because they don't throw out food, they don't throw out garbage, they throw out manuals. Weather protected data that I can come after and get from you. They kind of give you a good snapshot view of their daily existence, morning, noon, and night. Armed with the hacker's ammunition, Captain Zap got to work. Sit down in front of the terminal, turn it on, and start hacking. And spend hours and hours trying to get in. Right? And once you got in, you were, you know, do you want to play a game? We would dial into their maintenance ports, and because there was no detection back then, the maintenance ports were going to the answer. The system would come up and identify itself as, hi, this is the Ardmore switch, uh, number five ESS, log on password, guest, guest, you're in. Captain Zap fashioned himself as a modern day Robin Hood, an electronic outlaw. We decided that we were going to change clocks and the switches around the country so that we got free long distance or discounted long distance. Captain Zap succeeded in changing the clocks in the national telephone charging system, giving everyone discounted calls in peak time. Wow. In hacker terminology, he owned it. I knew more about the phone company switch than they did. Standards. Inside AT&T's computers, day became night, and night became day. We changed their clocks so that it was an exact 12-hour difference. Millions of Americans started saving money, but none of them knew it. Neither did the phone company.
they sort of have the job. And he's one of the first generation of hackers, the people that figured out how to do it when, figured out how to do it. Captain Zapp had discovered he could hack almost anything from almost anywhere. A career of mischief making had begun. Where did Wire Magazine, the top hack, ever done? By any hacker, was the AT&T Time Clock hack. They consider that the finest hack ever. What Captain Zapp had done was only discovered when the next set of phone bills started going out. But by then, he disappeared back into cyberspace. He wasn't caught for 18 months. That was a natural trace. I could have sold drugs or I could have stolen cars or been a rock musician, but now I decided to become a techno freak. And it was a whole lot easier to run the laws against it. Twenty years later, there are laws against it. NYPD Computer Crime Squad has a growing team of detectives expanding to deal with the weight of the work they face. A computer forensics lab backs them up. Okay, I think now, this much of the documentary should serve our purpose today. What if you have the capability today to do what Captain Seven done? Uh, what did he do? What did he do? You sneak into the computer of AT&T, the big phone company in the United States, not really charges very high price to launch a long distance call. And he changed the cost. Not only the peak hours, in the peak hour you have to pay perhaps $10 per minute, or in the what we call the non peak hour, you might have to pay $1 per minute. So he changed the clock of the computer of the phone company, and the phone company did not notice that. A lot of Americans did not notice that they're saving money until the phone company checked on the accounting record. Why in this particular month? We lose so much of our revenue compared to the other ones. And then they start to look into the picture and they discover that someone must have hacked into our system to do something. And these happen only 18 months after they have done this. Okay? So it's a very interesting story. It's a documentary it's of hacking business. Now, what he said is very meaningful. He told us, with that skill, when he sneaked into the company, there are many things he could do to steal money, okay, turn things around, uh, to do something on your privacy issues, but he didn't do it, right? So, uh, as you can see from here on the right hand side here, I did not include all those documentary. You can see a lot more here. It's very uh, inspirational watch some of those documentaries to know the state of practice in a hacking business, okay? Another one that is very interesting is called Freedom Dark Time, a true story of this hacker called Calvin the Nick, okay? We're going to introduce to you who this guy is. That is a very interesting piece, which is also carried here, all right? Um, right? Oh, I also include the Edward Snowden piece. It's a very uh, inspirational one. Uh, okay, you know who Edward Snowden is? No? Okay, then you need to watch the episode here. Anyway, uh, with this much, I hope that with the uh, date number 12, uh, which is about the security, and also a little bit about the hacking behind the scenes, uh, the easiest way for you and I know some background about this, is to watch some of those documentary, well selected, and the story is well told. And if you believe that you want to have a little bit more, here are three important panel for you to watch and read, okay? So, allow me to say that it's going to be very much exciting when we step into week number six, and when we are going to step out of week number six. So the African issues of 
hacking and cracking is well illustrated in those documentaries. You can just take this cracking is doing something bad, hacking is doing something neutral, but it could be bad or good. Sometimes we use the word ethical hacking to represent some hacker who has a good intention to test the system and then report back to the system owner what's wrong with the system and normally today they're paid to do it, okay? Um, that's very interesting. And then we also cover the attack business. That's our um, last time, the web attack. As you can see that uh, on day number 10, we invite you to go home to study what is meant by a DOS attack, a denial of service attack. That means if I have a system which allows me to use the service, but in order not to allow you to use the service for the good reasons, I can keep the system busy so that you just have to wait forever. Okay? And you believe that you're waiting for your service, but you were kept from using the service forever because it's called deny of service. You are denying of the service and it's an attack. Okay? So you can take a look at the types of deny of service attack here. Okay? Um, and also, what is the uh, what is the typical example of such attack? You can see um, this particular video right here. So this free specific um, documentary or lessons presented by uh, this very interesting person at the very beginning should be something you should not miss. Okay? Uh, you should know something about the very famous buffer overflow attacks. Okay? Example of these and the basic principle of how this could be done, particularly those who would like to know something technical about us. All right, so this is day number 10. And then this is week number six. Um, we are into uh, self-regulated learning the second week. So what are you going to learn? Before we close today's class, I want to offer you something from Macau, okay? From Macau. Uh, click on this link on day number 11. Computer security essentials. Okay, then you will be brought into this page. Here we have part one, part two, part three, part four, part five, generated by an organization in Macau called Mozert. It's a very useful and an interesting organization which is installed under the Macau New Technology Incubation Center, something like this. What are all these? Uh, important do uh, tips that's give you one all right so hopefully here we go we both have uh, English and Chinese all right so have you seen this before okay read this and try to discover what you can learn from this okay computer safety tips many people would like to have some practical knowledge on doing this in Chinese Cantonese is called Alright, do you know this? Well, we are, we are proud to have an organization like this in the town. Alright, so this is a very interesting, very useful piece of information. Um, of course, we got the second one about email. Um, in, in case of, we got some email traps. Okay, so this is another one. Give you some tips on how to protect yourself uh, from those intruding emails. And then you have the spyware one, very useful. All right, so read this. It's very easy to read. Uh, the magnificent software, that means the software which does not carry good intentions. Uh, it will stay in your computer looking for opportunity to steal some of your private sensitive information such as password or your bank account number uh, very interesting read them instructions wise they give you an idea they give you the, the, the travel shooting tips and very good work on and then this is the trap networks all right so get yourself familiar with those basic knowledge i'm not going to examine on those things, we do not need to reproduce them, but make the best use of them, all right? So, uh, I know that many of you would like to have some tips like this, and very important tips is produced by the Mozart in the year, I guess, 2012, yes. 
It's very good. So now allow me to take attendance for a day, and then I'll give you time to continue conversations to form teams, all right? It's very important that you have your teams ready before the end of this Saturday. Oh, yes. <laughs> Stop. I'm sorry. I missed you. So I'll give you time now, all right? Here you go. Five minutes. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. 
impact our our policy will be stolen. SQL poison. SQL is a computer language that is used in open or safe database. Session hijacking. In fact, I don't know. Okay, thank you, staff, for making your time. Meet the point at this time. Thank you very much. Now, allow me to take attendance, and then I'll let you go. It's a very uh, time-efficient way to use our classroom here, okay? So let's go back to the attendance call. In your class, or after your attendance has been called, you can go. Johnson, you're here. You don't. You don't. Not here, okay? Stop is here. Ken. Yes. Thank you. Terry. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Iris. Thank you. Andy. Thank you. Christina. Thank you. Gabriella. Not here today. Okay. Uh, Sonia. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Cleo. Thank you. All right. Uh, Joey. Thank you, Winnie. Thank you, Xiao Wei. Thank you, Danny. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, Gala. Thank you, uh, Blue. Thank you, Karim. Thank you, uh, Ming Xian. Thank you. Louise. Thank you. Uh, Raymond. Raymond. Not yet. All right. Steve. John. Steve. Steve. Not yet. Okay. Uh, and then the Dean. Thank you. All right. The second page. Serenia. Thank you. Muffin. Thank you. Brad, thank you. Michelle, thank you. Uh, Fatima, thank you. Heidi, thank you. Uh, Karen, thank you. Erica, thank you. Uh, Yoga, thank you. Yoga, you're right. Gampo, thank you. Winda, thank you. Um, Ada, thank you. Steve, Chen, thank you. Jia, thank you. Khan, thank you. Anna, thank you very much. Now we have actually given you a lot of things in this class, including documentaries, the two sub video, the ideas. And the most important thing for you to do is to make sure you have a team, report the team information to me using week number six documents given in online, and get ready for your learning hub ranked number three, which I'm going to tell you a little bit more next Monday. Great! Enjoy your weekend! Alright, thank you very much! Bye bye, bye bye!
你哋用香港聽熟多啲啦。咁就要你哋聽啲入嚟。誒有邊個唔明？咁你可唔可以出嚟？你接收埋佢咧？你接收埋佢未簡單，但係如果你接收一個嘅話，咁可能要入另一個 team 咧，又會有兩個 team 嘅三個 pair 喎。咁你就開始我我嘅心情要有改善。所以太早我就。Section 1, Information Security and Privacy, Day Number 12.